going on? It's Andy from Commander Cast, and with this video, as you know from the Iron Man mask when I got that shit on, you know it's time for another Commander Cast video. We're going to be doing a little talk about Horde Magic. So this is a variant format designed by a guy named Peter Nudz, and I'm terribly sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, as I'm almost certain I am. There will be links down in the video description that will send you to the original articles that he produced for Quiet Speculation, and the follow-up as well. There he details the overall rules in a little bit more detail than I'm going to do in this video, but this video is here just to kind of give you an overall uh, primer, let's say, to the concept of Horde Magic. So, what's the deal with Horde Magic? Why are we talking about it on Commander Cast? Well, it's a variant format for EDH that's designed for almost cooperative play, which is something that Magic has always kind of lacked. Uh, actually, a lot of competitive games lack it. But Pete's gone and made a pretty decent variant that allows you to play even by yourself if you're so inclined, which is not the most fun, I will admit. But it's something, if you have nothing else to do, you want to test out how your horde works, you can actually do that by yourself without having that weird and quasi-sociopathic need to play both sides of your deck, which makes you look like a real fucking weirdo, in my opinion. In any case, so the premise behind Horde Magic is that you take your EDH decks, and those function as kind of survivors in a zombie apocalypse scenario, and then the horde deck, in this instance, is zombies, and they just attack you mindlessly until you're dead. So the idea is kind of that... You know, something's happened, there's zombies all over the place, and you have to defend your home turf from them. Eventually you go out and hopefully you finish off kind of the zombie plague that's all over the place. And whether that happens or not is all determined throughout the course of the game. Uh, the rules, in a nutshell, you have however many survivors. Personally, this horde can handle maybe three players with mediocre power decks, and that's something we'll get into later. But ideally, yeah, you've got three. The decks aren't crazy powerful. There's certain archetypes you should probably avoid if you're going to be playing against a horde. Um, but... Depending on the horde, you can play with any number of players. Um, they can play all kinds of different decks. But all you have to do is survive the zombies attacking you. So at the start of the game, the survivor decks, they had a couple turns, and they used those to set up their defenses. The official rule, official rule, is that you have three turns to set up your defenses, lay down your lands, etc. You can reduce that or increase that, I find, as needed as you play against your horde and you figure out how your decks kind of sit against it when you're playing with it. Personally, uh, as the decks got a little bit better in my area, we reduced the number of turns that you got in setup. Also, depending on the number of players you have, that's very important as well. If I'm playing with four players against this horde, normally I'll have no setup time, and the horde just starts attacking you. Sometimes they just wreck you, blow you out, they flip a whole lot of zombies on the first turn or something like that, but normally I find things work out and you end up with a pretty decent game overall. So, the, the survivors are basically playing a regular game of EDH. They have their decks, they have their commander, they play their turns as per usual. The only difference is you have a shared life total. For every survivor deck, you have 20 health. So if you have four players, you'll have 80 health in total among everybody. You all block collectively. You all take turns at the same time. So untap, upkeep, draw. That's all done at the same time for every player. And that's pretty much it. There's a lot of cards that you should avoid in your survivor decks. And if you're not purposefully building survivor decks, which is a whole other category of deck building, and that'd be a whole other video, uh, you have to sort of accept that this format has inherent limitations. Because the Horde is incapable of making decisions, and as a result, there are certain types of permanents it's not actually capable of interacting with or winning against. I suppose it could beat some of them, but it's so difficult it really robs the experience of any kind of tension, and it just makes it really uninteresting. So the things you kind of want to stay away from are like mode effects, like Stormtide Leviathan, Megas of the Moat, mode itself, that kind of thing. Uh, solitary confinement is another thing that essentially makes the, so the Horde cannot win. Um, in those instances, if you're playing a traditional EDH deck and you have those cards, what I recommend you do is you draw it, you reveal it to the other players, and you just cycle it. That allows you to play a more traditional deck without, you know, you don't have to build something entirely just to play this secondary format that's already a variant on a casual format with kind of wonky rules. It just kind of saves everyone some time without robbing the experience of any pleasure you can get out of it. So then when it's the Horde's turn, all the Horde does is reveal the top card of its library. If it's a zombie token, or I use personally token creature of any kind. These are all zombie tokens. There's a substantial number of them. I believe I have uh, 45 in my horde. So when you flip a zombie token, you flip again, and you just keep flipping as long as you reveal a zombie token or a zombie giant token, or I use skeleton tokens as well, just for a little variation. Uh, the regeneration adds an interesting aspect to it. In any case, you reveal the tokens until you get a non-token card. It could be anything. You get a Lord of the Pit, which is awesome, of course. Uh, you can get a Plague Wind, which can be a real blow, or you can get something lesser, like uh, a Reassembling Skeleton. And then it plays the tokens first, and then it plays the non-token card, and then it goes to its attack phase. In the attack phase, all zombies attack all the time, all zombies have haste that the Horde controls, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it never blocks, every creature controls always attacks. That's the thing with the Horde, it can never make any decisions. 
So when you're designing your deck, you have to keep that in mind and avoid cards that have things like uh, targeting stipulations, unless you think that they're relatively clear. For example, I have a card here, Dregs of Sorrow. This does involve targeting, but it's target X non-black creatures. As a result, it can't actually target of its own, any of its own creatures. So by default, what we say is it attacks, sorry, it targets every creature on the board um, that is capable of targeting. And in the, in the case of Dregs of Sorrow, it's a really awesome effect for the Horde. Because the other thing about the Horde is it's considered to have limitless mana. So during its main phases, anything that has in its hand, and the Horde doesn't normally have a hand, because all you do is flip these cards. It also has no land. Um, if you're flipping cards, or if it's drawing cards somehow, something like one of your friends is playing a Font of Mythos, that's rough against the Horde, because it gets to play everything that it draws as soon as it can during a main phase. So with the unlimited mana, it also creates some other effects. Uh, for example, if you have unearthed cards, it will automatically play those as soon as it can. Uh, if it can regenerate things like your Skeleton, your Mortivore, it will always do that because it always has mana on hand for the regeneration. Otherwise, it's you know it's pretty simple. The Horde attacks you until you're dead, or the Horde is dead. Now, for the survivors to win, what you have to do is remove all the zombies from the board and have the, the zombie deck, the Horde deck, with no cards in it, so empty library. And to facilitate that, you don't have to just sit back on defense. If you attack the Horde, for each point of damage you, you effectively mill a card from the Horde deck and place it into the Horde's graveyard. So once the library is empty, there's no zombies on the board, you are the winner, and your friend, teammates, I suppose. Now one important distinction I do like to make, my zombie tokens, I count these as actually being zero casting cost cards. So if you do something like evacuation, you're only sparing yourself for a turn, it effectively becomes a very fancy fog. Uh, similarly, it allows you to put the zombie tokens in the graveyard, and that way cards like uh, Zombie Apocalypse become awesome. Because when the Horde plays that, it gets all the zombies back. It also makes it so, I think traditionally the ADH decks now increasingly include graveyard removal. Those are no longer blank cards. In fact, they're very pertinent against my Horde. So that's a huge plus. Adds another dynamic to the game. So, like I advise, just treat zombie tokens, I recommend anyway, as zero casting cost 2-2 zombie creatures. And that uh, has really been working out for me. It's a subtle modification to the original rules, but I really like it. It makes the Horde much more threatening. Uh, a lot of the cards are a lot more difficult to answer now. Uh, additionally, you know, I already have a lot of zombie tokens here. Keep extras on deck, because you never know when you're Endless Ranks of the Dead, or you're going to siphon flesh, and you're going to end up with some extra zombies. Uh, I don't like to take them out of the graveyard from ones that have been already killed, and I don't like to fish through the deck just to get some extra zombies. You want to keep things, you know, you want to maintain game state, effectively. Now, another thing, because the Horde's deck is its life total, let's say the Horde gains life somehow. Uh, maybe you've played an effect that through some bizarre happenstance causes it to gain life. Uh, I actually include cards that actively cause it to gain life, like uh, Blood Tithe and Subversion and Siphon Soul. For every point of life that the Horde gains, I take one of the zombie cards from the graveyard and tuck it back into the deck. Not everyone does that. Personally, I find it adds a little bit of longevity to the Horde every now and then. These cards can be quite effective. Not only do they drain the survivors, but they also give the Horde a little bit more juice, which I kind of like. So the next thing I'm going to talk about here is the composition of the Horde. Now, obviously, you want to have a lot of tokens, because a lot of the suspense comes from flipping the tokens off the top and seeing how many it gets. If you get bull rushed by, you know, 15 zombies at the very beginning of the game, obviously it's going to be a very short game. Those tend to be not all that interesting, but with the setup time, a lot of the time you can mitigate that, and you end up with some kind of very interesting back and forth a lot of the time, despite the fact that the Horde is not actually playing anything against you. Uh, other types of cards you want to include in some kind of removal. So, you have to remember, the Horde's not supposed to make decisions. Therefore, cards like Barter and Blood, Innocent Blood, uh, Siphon Flesh, Plague Wind, those supply the Horde with some kind of removal. Uh, things like Call to the Grave are obviously outstanding for it, and Grave Pact as well. Actually forces very difficult decisions. One of the problems with the Horde is that once your survivors stabilize, it's very difficult for the Horde to come back. So something like Grave Pact actually forces them to decide, you know, do I want to block these stupid zombies with my 5-5 creatures? Uh, because in all likelihood, I'll be losing them to the Grave Pact. So Butcher of Malakir I use as a secondary one. Um, and that's another issue I should quickly touch on, I suppose, is non-zombie creatures in a zombie horde, or I suppose any kind of horde. Um, generally, I think they probably work best with the tribal theme. So you can apply a blanket rule, like all the zombies have haste, all zombies are constantly attacking. So let's say you have Butcher of Malakir or the Lord of the Pit. Uh, it's demon, obviously. So it doesn't follow the same rules. It doesn't get the haste. It still attacks every turn, though. And uh, another example, too, with Lord of the Pit is it actually forces a decision. The, the horde has to sacrifice a creature. Usually, if it's a choice like that, you just apply common sense. We normally have it sacrifice a zombie token that it happens to have on hand, and then the Lord of the Pit stays on the board, and you get to use Lord of the Pit, which is awesome. But this is no Lord of the Pit video. Uh, some other nuances to constructing your horde. 
you have to decide, it, it's fairly easy actually to scale the difficulty. Now some of the randomness you can't account for. If it just happens to flip a lot of zombie tokens off the hop, yeah, you're probably going to lose, that's fine, shuffle up, play again. But I find the things that actually make the Horde exceptionally powerful are certain categories of disruption cards. Discard is very powerful, because the Horde is not affected by it. There's a lot of very strong symmetrical discard effects in Magic. So they can lay that down all day and the Horde will be unaffected, whereas the players are all going to be mumbling and grumbling when Delirium Skines hits. So you also have to consider your zombie lords. How powerful do you want your zombies to eventually be? Uh, Undead Warchief is obviously very strong for the Horde. It adds a substantial quantity of power to just your vanilla 2-2s. Two but then you've also got little effects like Bad Moon. I've got a Cemetery Reaper in here, uh, Ascendant Evancar, which is cool because it minuses uh, the power toughness of all your opponent's creatures. Generally speaking, unless they're playing a, you know, a mono black deck. Uh, but yeah, little things like that are ways you can tweak your Horde composition. So I'm going to bring the camera down here, and then we're going to take a little closer look at some of the specific categories of cards. I'm going to talk about why I've included what I have. So obviously the core of your horde is zombies, and quite here, right here we've got quite a few zombie tokens. Uh, these form the bulk of the damage that's going to be dealt to the players, and if you get a lot of them on board, they can suddenly become pretty threatening. The number of tokens that you have obviously makes a significant impact in what your flips are like. If you have less tokens, you're less likely to be bum-rushed by a whole bunch of zombies. If you have more, it becomes uh, a higher possibility, but I also find it makes the games less interesting because just getting attacked by grizzly bears all day, that's not really why we play Magic, even in this kind of format. So I've actually axed a couple. Um, I think my count is a little bit lower than most people's, but it's been serving me well, and in place, I put in some different tokens. Now, Zombie Giants, this is a great way to modulate the difficulty, um, and I think with most hordes that you build, if you have some kind of tribal theme, you can throw a secondary tribe in there. Like, for example, I'm building a Beast Horde currently, and the secondary tribe is dragon tokens. So those, you know, they add some evasion and they're a little bit bigger. Just creates a little bit of variance. It's kind of fun. Zombie giants, if those start to come down early, they're very threatening before the players really have a good chance to build solid defenses. Uh, oftentimes you got to throw some of your creatures in front that you don't really want to. So they're a great way to make the game more difficult. I have a bunch of extra zombie giants on hand. So if I'm playing against certain people, or sorry, playing with certain people, I can just slot in a bunch of extra zombie giants and uh, suddenly things can get a lot more challenging. The skeletons are different in that they're just perpetual. Um, unless somebody goes really far out of their way to remove them, generally they stay on the board for the entire game, and they sit there pinging away, and they just keep regenerating from all the damage base sweepers, from the combat, etc. So they're uh, just, you know, an interesting addition to the horde. They're also kind of on theme. Uh, I, I personally like them. I don't know if anybody else uses them, but they're pretty good as far as that goes. Now, in our other categories of cards, obviously we have quite a few here. I've tried to divide them up into categories, and I apologize for the glare. I don't live in a film studio, so, you know, I'm doing the best I can here. So here we have uh, zombie sweepers, or at least removal of sorts. Uh, you can kind of get the gist here. I'm not going to go over every card, because, you know, I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're smart enough to figure out how to use YouTube. You can probably figure out how to build a sort of automated horde. I will say, uh, Plague Wind is amazing when the horde flips it. And Siphon Flesh was an excellent addition for the Horde's purposes. Now, Dregs of Sorrow, I did talk about this card earlier, and it's not very good, so you probably won't use it in much of anything else just because of the mana cost. But when the Horde has limitless mana, it is amazing, because when the Horde draws those cards, it's just going to play them right away. So if you have a lot of creatures in play, this can kind of turn the tables for the Horde, which is great. Because once you get far enough ahead, the challenge is just gone. It's no longer fun. So this creates some tension. Uh, there's a substantial risk with playing too many creatures if you suspect. Well, I guess there's no real way to know if it's going to draw this unless you're playing some you know, real crazy cards like Spy Network or something. But you never know. So this card can kind of keep people honest. Uh, if you're in a runaway situation, this quickly turns the tides. Now this is some... Uh, well, some of it's permanent base removal. The other one's a zombie apocalypse because it's awesome. And it's also a good demonstrator of why I think you should use your zombie tokens as zero casting cost 2-2 creatures instead of just following the traditional token rules for the purposes of this format. Grave Pack will force difficult decisions. Call to the Grave obviously just works in the favor of zombies. Now here is an interesting category of cards. I don't have a whole lot of them. I have the Rotting Rats over here to back it up. They're zombies as well, which is beautiful. But uh, these are discard. Necrogen Mist just sits there makes people uh, get rid of cards. I took out Bottomless Pit because everyone hated playing against it so much. I used to have three in here. That was probably a bit of overkill. Necrogen Mist is a, a much gentler version of the same card, whereas Delirium Skines is just mass discard. Now, these effects, you know, much like in traditional Commander, uh, they're not very popular to play against, and that's because they are powerful. 
If you want your horde to be more powerful, just include more of these kind of effects. The only trade-off is your opponents might have, sorry, the people playing against them. You're not your opponents, uh, you're the horde's collective opponent. Anyway, these kind of cards can make some people a little bit sour on the game because they're quote-unquote less fun to play against, but they're a, a great way to increase the power and challenge if that's what you're looking for. Now here I have a couple of unearthed creatures. The Grixis Slave Driver is just a throw-in because I owned one and it makes zombies, so go figure. But the rats are very good because they come into play, they're little 1-1s, one -ones, whatever. If your opponents block them, though, they're going to end up discarding another card as it becomes unearthed. So, very good addition. Uh, I really like them. Uh, you know, try them out, see how you feel about it. And also just gives you a little taste, too, of the discard. You can also input, include some, like, Cackling Fiends or Liliana Spectres or whatever. Pretty solid card as far as that goes. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Unearth, though, is that it will always unearth these cards. Now, I make it so that the Horde only spends mana on its pre-combat main phase instead of having the secondary one as well. It just makes things a little bit cleaner, so these always come out at a more pertinent time and uh, then swing in after the discard. Here I just have Miscellaneous Zombies. Noxious Ghoul is really good. Uh, I would definitely include that. You might actually want multiples if you want to increase the difficulty yet again. Whereas Infectious Horror, you know, he's just, eh, all right. Um, the way that we play is that each opponent, and it says something like that, or each player, you count every one of the survivors. So if you're playing against four survivors, if the horde's fighting four survivors, when Infectious, infectious Horror attacks, they'll collectively lose eight life. I don't know if everyone plays that way, but it's been working out for me. Over here, I have some regenerating zombies. I also have a Mortivore, which is a non-zombie, but just gives the horde a really dangerous beater. The wonderful thing, though, is that the it's not a zombie. It's a Lurgoyf. So when it comes into play, your uh, survivors actually have a turn to prepare for it, try to remove it, whatever. That can be really interesting in the late game. Reassembling Skeleton will just keep coming back, just like in regular EDH, so he's a solid addition here as well. Now, these are just miscellaneous zombies that I had laying around. Uh, I wanted to try out some of the Innistrad ones, and I found them pretty worthless with most other formats, so I just like to use cards that I own. Brain Gorgers is kind of interesting because people can counter it. Uh, Soulless one, though, I would recommend you include a couple of those if you own them. I only own one, so that's that. This is the life gain category of cards. I already talked about those. They just give the horde a little bit more legs. Subversion is kind of funny, though. As it ticks down, the zombie, the horde gets back the zombies. It looks from being a real crappy enchantment to something that your uh, survivors have to deal with. Cemetery Reaper, you never use the activated ability. He's just there because he pumps zombies. And the Ascendant Avancar is a pump, and uh, he's a debuff for your opponent's creatures, which makes him great. Again, if you had multiples of those, you might want to use them. Bad Moon, fun card. I had two laying around. Why not? Uh, Lord of the Pit is just there mostly for nostalgia reasons because it's one of my favorite cards of all time. The new art is super badass, even though it's foil. I wish I'd get a non-foil version, but whatever. Butcher of Malachir is a second grave pack. If I had another grave pack just sitting around, I would actually probably replace the Butcher with another grave pack, but I don't. So that's that. Now, uh, Hideous Visage. This is not a very good card. But when you can give your zombies the Intimidate all of a sudden, sometimes, you know, five or six zombies get through for a turn, and that makes the game uh, very different when your life total suddenly go down that substantially. And over here, we just have some uh, generic zombie buff cards. Undead, uh, Undead Warchief, you know what that does. Endless Ranks of the Dead, that's a really fun addition to this, actually. I'm really glad that came with Instrad. If they both end up on the table, things can get pretty crazy. Now, Mode of the Unhallowed is actually one of the more feared non-zombie cards just because it makes a lot of zombies on the spot. They get four zombies for one card. So if they've already flipped a bunch of zombie tokens, then, uh, yeah, that's going to be a lot of zombies. Now, there's a couple cards I don't use here, and I'm sure different people use different cards in their own hordes. So, you know, uh, if you talk to other Yeech players, yeah, just hash it out, see what you like, see what you don't like, share your technology. So that's an introduction to my horde. Next, I'm going to actually play some games against it and show you guys how it works. I'm going to show you a solo game, and then I'm going to actually play a two-versus horde game with my wife. Okay, so I should have everything I need here to play an actual game of horde. I got dice, dice for days. I got my life counter here. Now, because there's only one player, I have 20 life, which will be signified by my little spin down here. I'm not sure how well you can see that. I will be playing my mono red Jaya Ballard Task Mage deck. Uh, I hope I shuffled it before I sat down to do this. Yeah, okay. So it's reasonably well shuffled. Uh, now, because it's one versus the horde, we're going to reduce the horde deck to 45 cards, and I'm going to play against that. If you have two players, it's recommended that you put 60 cards in the deck. At three, 75, and at four or more, you play with the full 100 card horde. So uh, it's still fairly difficult with 45 cards. And the reason I'm playing a mono red deck, it's not great against the horde. Um, actually, it's rather difficult to play, but 
uh, most of my decks are centered around non-traditional axes of play like land destruction or hand discard and they simply don't work against the horde so there's no point in trying to demonstrate how to play like that so i split the horde this is the 45 cards i'm going to be playing against this is the remainder i'll no longer need it I also have extra zombie tokens on hand, just in case you never know when some effect's going to create extra zombies outside the horde. So I'm going to shuffle it up. Now you notice because I'm a cheap asshole, I use penny sleeves. Uh, it's 100 sleeves for a dollar. They never break, but you can tell which ones are going to be tokens before you flip. That's not a major concern. It's not like you're playing for money or anything like that. And really, if someone's so determined to get ahead that they're really worried about this, well, maybe this isn't the format for them. Uh, it's not exactly com designed with competitive players in mind. So... To begin the game again, I have 20 life, I have my own deck, and here's the horde, they're gonna start attacking me in three turns, let's get it! Okay, so I draw I draw my first hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I draw for my first turn. Okay, it's a two-lander, but uh, whatever, we'll see what happens. So I play a land, pass the turn, pick up, that wasn't a land, that's no good. So two mana, I'm going to play uh, Stigma Lasher. I can already hear people at home laughing about the way I build my decks. Deal with it! So there we go, and this is my third and final turn before, before the Horde starts attacking me. Well, that's timely at least, but it's probably not going to help me very much. So I play Journeyer's Kite, and now it's the Horde's turn. So it flips. So it flipped two zombies, because these are zombie tokens, and now it's going to play whatever this card is, which is a Rotting Rats, which makes me discard a card. Wonderful. So I'm going to discard uh, Disaster Radius, because I strongly suspect I'll never be able to cast it. So this is my commander up here. I'm going to put my life to counter on it. Here's my deck so you can see it, and here's my graveyard. I'm hoping that's not obscuring too much of your view. And then uh, the zombies all have haste, so they all attack. I'm attacked for five. Uh, I'm going to block the Rotting Rats, because I have nothing to lose here. It's going to come back into play at some point again anyway, so I'd rather discard some of the high mana cost shit I have now and kill the rats. It goes to the, the horde's equivalent of a graveyard. Now, again, important to note is the fact that I uh, only let the horde cast spells on its first pre-combat main. So it's done for the turn. I took four damage, puts me down to 16. Now you'll see the life totals disappear uh, at an alarming pace in one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, thank God, I got a mountain. Uh, but uh, still a little bit lacking here in things I can do. So, I'm going to just Journeyer's Kite now, grab myself another mountain, put it in my hand, because I don't really have anything worth doing. I have a Radiate in my hand. Uh, sorry, not Radiate. What am I talking about? Uh, the one with Buyback. You guys know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, yeah, Reiterate. I've got that in my hand, but I don't think the Horde's going to cast anything I can Reiterate. So I pick up a mountain, put it in my hand, and then the Horde turns. Horde turn. So it untaps, plays the Rotting Rats. I have to discard a card. Uh, I'm going to discard Distorting Lens, and the Horde flips up a Rotting Fen Snake. Oh, that'll fuck me up. Okay, so again, all the zombies have haste, so they all attack. Now, I'm pretty much going to have to block the Rotting Fen Snake, because I need to preserve my life total here. So, my Stigma Lasher expires, so does the Rotting Fen Snake, and I take 5 damage, putting me down to 11. Uh, I think this is going to be a short game here, but at least you're seeing how the Horde functions. So this, as per the Unearth rules, are it's going to be exiled, and the two zombies stand play tapped. My turn again. Okay, it was a mountain. That's a plus. Uh, I don't think I have any guys that can save me at this point, though. Uh, so I'm going to be basically forced into playing Jaya, who can chump block. And then I'm done. Pass the turn. The horde flips up Abattoir Ghoul. So it's first strike, and if it kills my creatures, it's gonna, the horde's going to gain life, so it'll get that Rotting Fen Snake back. Okay, that, you know what? That's not the worst thing it could have flipped. And it attacks me with all these creatures. Okay, uh, that's seven damage. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to block in the interest of not losing. So I can lose Jaya, which is okay. She goes to the graveyard. Uh, sorry, the command zone. I'm going to put her back in there, and I take five. That takes me down to six. So I'm pretty hurting right now, and Jaya has expired once. My own turn again. Another mountain. Okay. Uh, well, depending on what the Horde draws next, I'm going to win or lose, uh, so might as well go in on a Hoarding Dragon. Hoarding Dragon, just a good card in general, but I'm sure if you've listened to Commander Cast before, you already know how I feel about it. And I'm going to find myself something that can give me some life, uh, probably a Basilisk Caller, because that's pretty solid with a lot of cards in this deck, just by coincidence. Now, how long will the, will the Dragon die anytime soon? I don't know, um, but I just need something that can keep me in the game if I manage to stick around. Where did you go? 
Relic of Progenitus is always tempting to take, though. <laughs> uh, there we go. Of course, it was right near the top. So I put the Basilisk Call underneath the Hoarding Dragon and pass the turn to the Horde. And uh, I'm probably dead here, but let's see. Reassembling Skeleton. Okay, that actually gives me a bit of a breather. So it plays the Skeleton. Uh, it has nothing in the graveyard. It can reanimate with an Unearth, or it has no other spells in hand, so it just goes in with all these zombies. And I'm going to block the Avatar Ghoul. So it will expire, and I take 4 damage, putting me down to 2, uh, less than healthy 2. And then it's my turn. Untap, draw. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'm dead. Um, it depends again on what that thing flips, but... Uh, up, up, let's put Jaya in, because I need a chump blocker. That makes me sad, but... Pay the general tax, put her in, and then I'm done. Word on taps, flips, hideous visage, and I'm dead. Creatures you control gain intimidate until in a turn. There you go, I talked about that earlier. Gives it that bit of evasion, they sneak through, and they put me under, which is fine. I more or less expected that. Like I said, uh, playing one-on-one -on -one against it is actually kind of difficult. So, uh, yeah, that said, you've, you've seen basically how the horde functions. It's pretty simple, it's pretty mindless, which matches the flavor of zombies pretty well, I feel. So the next game that you see is going to be me and my wife playing a sort of tag team game versus the Horde in which it'll have 60 cards. So between the two of us, we should have some better defenses to shore up its early attacks. Alright, so after the Horde beat me in the earlier game, I'm back with some backup. I brought my wife, Carolyn, who's playing her Karthus Tyrant of Jund deck. I'm going to be playing my Braids Conjure Adept deck now because there's two of us. Uh, we have a combined life total of 40, and then the Horde has 60 cards total. As you can see, I got the dice bag here, and extra zombies just in case the Horde puts some into uh, play with something like Moan of the Unhallowed. All right, so we're going to kick the game off. We each draw our opening hands. Are you content with what you have? Okay. So we both like our opening hands, so we're going to play our first turn. Now we get three turns before the zombies start attacking us. I played a snow-covered island. I played a forest. So sick. All right, we're done. Draw again. I played another snow-covered island. Keep up with me. I'm playing, um, I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> what is this, stupid fantasy the name? The oh. Refuge. Oh my god, we gained a life, though. No, that's not a bounce land. It's a life gain land. Now we're rich. Now we're winning. I done? like an idiot. <laughs> I do every week on my stupid show. All right, wrong <laughs> card. Okay, so this is our third turn, so this is the last one before the zombies start attacking us. And uh, neither of us really have a whole lot of defensive board presence yet. I'm going to play a Whisper Silk Cloak to protect Braids eventually. I'm going to play Yavimaya Elder. Okay. Now this is a, a point here too. Steel Hellkite is a card that's so powerful against the Horde, it basically makes it so that there's no challenge. So this is a good example of a card that you're going to want to just cycle if you drew, if you want to play an entertaining game. So I'm going to put it off to the side and exile it and just draw another card. And then we're done three turns, so whoop whoop, here come the zombies. And they flip. Uh-oh. So two zombies, a skeleton, a skeleton, and barter and blood. Yes! So we each sacrifice two creatures. Now the horde basically will always make the decision to sacrifice zombie tokens if it can, so all that's left is the skeleton. Skeletons don't have haste, and Carolyn's Yavimaya Elder died, so she's going to get some lands, and then it's going to be our turn. That was sick, Carolyn! Value! What'd you get, Carolyn? I revealed them. A forest, I mean a mountain and a swamp. Nice. Her, her short-term memory is on the way out, unfortunately. It's a real tragic story. Okay, so when she's done shuffling, then it's our turn again, so untap, upkeep, draw. Always done collectively as a team, just like everything else we do. <laughs> Except when she's hitting me. And I'm going to play another snow-covered island because I'm a boss like that. I played a mountain. Nice. And I'm going to play Braids and hope to reap the whirlwind next turn. I'm going to play Exploding Borders and deal horse three damage. <laughs> See this? Next level ramp, people. Next level! Oh, it's foil, too. So how much damage does the Horde take? Three. All right, so we've actually got some offense in, so we mill three. Oh, thank God. 
We got their stupid war chief. And a blood type. Take that, horde. Ugh, you idiots. That was sick play fist bump. <laughs> okay, so now it's the horde's turn. They flip. And they got a rotting rats, so we have to discard a card, Carolyn. Fuck! I'm gonna get rid of my trick bind, because I don't think it's gonna do very much against the horde. I'm gonna discard Dragon Roost. Okay. It's not slow. Totally sweet. And then they attack us with the rats and the skeleton. Um, do you want me to block the rats? Um, We're gonna have to discard again to it eventually, so we might as well. Sure. So I'm gonna block the rats with braids. Braids just shoes it away with her braids, just whipping around wildly. And uh, we take one from the skeleton. And then it's our turn. Untap, and then on your upkeep, put a creature, artifact, or land from your hand into play. I'm going to put in Academy Ruins. Everybody loves that card. You put a forest in? I'm putting a forest in. From Braids? Yeah. Okay. And then we draw. I got another land. That's whack. Uh, so I'll play a strip mine as my land for the turn. And tap five mana. And I'm going to play Parallel Thoughts. So that's a really interesting enchantment in EDH because uh, it's kind of like a super tutor. If your area is a bit short on enchantment hate, I really recommend you try it out. Uh, it's also just fun instead of the usual garbage that most people are playing. So I get to put seven cards underneath it of my choice. Uh, and I don't have to reveal them, but I can show them to you guys because we're obviously playing co-op here. What are you doing, Carolyn? I'm going to play uh, Nezumi Grave Robber. Ooh, that's a spicy meatball. Okay. I'm going to get a Caged Sun. Uh, an Overwhelming Intellect to get some card draw. Uh, trench Gorger to put down some serious beatings. I'm going to remove your card from your graveyard. Nice play. Flip mode! Transformer noise. <laughs> I'm going to get Sunstone, which is a really nice piece of tech. Uh, get a land. Get a soul ring. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm going to play Gift of the Gargantuan. And a time warp. What do you get with the gift? Oh, no lands. No lands. One creature. So Dead Witch Refolk goes in my hand. Yep, I'm going to put the Overwhelming Intellect on top of the stack and hope to counter a creature. I'll take a chance on that and uh, hope to counter a creature next turn. So are we done? I am done. Okay. Horde flips. One zombie, two zombies. And another zombie, the Infectious Horror, which is going to hurt us substantially every time it attacks. Okay, so they're coming Plus in. Rotting Rats comes Oh, in. yeah, Rotting oh, Rats. It plays it out of the graveyard, and we all have to discard a card. Oh, man, I'm really running out of cards. I'm going to get rid of Redirect, because it's probably not going to do very much against the Horde. I'm going to discard Deadwood Tree Folk. Sick idea. Okay, and then the Horde attacks us with all their riches. Uh, so when the Infectious Horror attacks, it, does, it causes uh, both of us to lose two life. So between the two of us, that's a total loss of four life, putting it at 36. I'm going to block the rats with braids. I'm going to block the skeleton. It'll sure. regenerate, but it'll save us yeah. some damage. So the Horde gets in for six damage. The Rotting Rats is exiled. And the skeleton regenerates, and it's our turn again. So untap. On our upkeep, we can put anything in. I'm going to put in uh, Teleria West. That's a pretty hurt and drop, but whatever. I'm going to put in uh, Quietus Spike. Okay, and then uh, for my turn, I'm going to draw out of my Parallel Thoughts library. And, uh, well, you doing anything? Because I'm not really. Um, I will play Carthus. Ooh. Okay. Beast mode engaged. And... I will... <gasps> I'll tag. 
Okay, so Karthus smashes the horde for seven. So mill one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we got a lot of tokens off of them. And we also put a Rotting Wraps into the graveyard, which they're going to reanimate with the Unearthed ability on their upkeep. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, so we're done. So it's the Horde's turn. They flip the top card. It's Endless Ranks of the Dead. Uh, that could get dangerous. And then it puts the Rotting Rats in. So we sacrifice... Uh, sorry, we discard a card, Carolyn. That's uh, a bit painful for me, but I'm going to discard Lock the Aeons. Uh, discard Cauldron Dance. Oh, we're just carting sweet shit. Yeah. Okay, and then the zombies attack us. So again, we lose four off the hop from the uh, infectious horror, and then we can assign blocks. So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna block the the rotting rats with braids and get it exiled. Um, and and block. I'll block the skeleton. Okay. So that's exiled. It's our turn. Uh, so untap on our upkeep. It really makes me really sad, but I can't warp anything in with braids. I was really counting on it playing a creature and drawing off the uh, overwhelming intellect. But I you can. can. No, I can't. Okay, Carolyn has nothing either. So, uh, when we draw, I guess I'll... I'm going to just draw off the top. Mind Slaver. So Mind Slaver doesn't do anything, because I can't control the Horde's turn. So I cycle it. And I got a snow-covered island. How sweet is that? I will equip Spike. I'm going to equip the Whisper Silk Cloak to Braids. Combat? She's thinking. Yeah. Okay. So Carolyn attacks the Horde. So Karthus does 7 damage. And what's the other thing on Quietus Spike? Whenever a equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses half his or her life rounded up. Okay, now because the Horde doesn't have any life, that doesn't do anything, but it still gives Karthus Death Touch, which counts for something, I guess. So we milled... Uh, oh, good. Oh, we milled some really good stuff off them, including the Dregs of Sar, which is really scary, and the Endless Ranks of the Dead, the second copy, which probably would have killed us if it came into play. Okay, are we done? Yeah. Okay. So Horde's turn, uh, it has nothing to reanimate out of the graveyard, untap it, and Endless Ranks of the Dead, so it has three zombies, so that means that it's going to get one zombie for free, and then it gets some tokens, two more zombies, and a Grixis Slave Driver. Oh, that's money. So I'll counter that using Overwhelming Intellect, and that will draw me six cards. So it gets these two zombies, and then it will immediately uh, recast the Grixis Slave Driver, unfortunately. But I will draw six cards out of my stash here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and my Parallel Lives is empty. And now we just have to survive this onslaught here. Uh, well, I'll use um, this ability. Night Eyes? Yeah, to get uh, something from our graveyard. Do you want it from our graveyard, or well, your graveyard, maybe? Where uh, they just have like zombie tokens mostly, and something that will pump zombies. Oh, not not uh, their zombies though. This might be good. The Avatar Ghoul has uh, first strike, and we gain life if it kills a creature, so we can kill that stupid infectious horror. Okay. Yeah. That'd be good. Killing that. Okay, so Carolyn puts in the Avatar Ghoul under our control with Night Eyes, and then the Horde attacks with everything. Zombies do have haste. So let's assign blocks. Uh, I'll block the skeleton, because braids can do that. <laughs> I don't want to lose her, though, because I'm going to warp something sweet in. Um, then I'll, I'll kill this. Okay, so Avatar Ghoul is going to block the Infectious Horror, which caused us to lose 4 life when it attacked, putting us at 22. Um, any other blocks? How much damage is that? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 14. That's going to hurt. But whatever. Block the Slave Driver and kill it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we trade with the Slave Driver, and that puts a 2-2 Zombie to play when it leaves play. And then we just take 10 damage. The Skeleton regenerates, and then we gain uh, 2 life. And we finally get rid of the stupid horror thing. Okay, and then it's our turn. So untap on our upkeep. We can warp something in with Braids. Uh, I'm going to warp in 
caged sun. Let's get rich. I'm going to name blue, obviously. So that doubles up my islands. And my Teleria West, which is pretty sweet. And it breeds a 3-3. Three, three. What are you putting in, Carolyn? Nothing. Nothing! Okay. Uh, then we draw. All right, it's time to go in. Let's see if we can finish them off, Carolyn. Uh, so I'll tap my strip mine to play a soul ring. And then... Uh, so right now these are 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, 2-2 two, two zombies. They don't have any pump. Um, then I will play Molten Disaster. But you'll... 2 Ooh! That's pretty funky fresh. So Carolyn plays Molten Disaster and blows up all these stupid zombies, because they're all stupid idiots. And we take two as well, and we mill two off the horde. Take that, you stupid zombies. And Braid survives with uh, one point of extra toughness from the Caged Sun. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I tap eight lands, and I'm going to play Trench Gorger. He's going to be the biggest boy. Uh, I'm going to exile all my remaining lands. Uh, are you doing anything else, Carol? Nope. Alright, so I drop Trench Gorger in, and uh, he devours 30 lands out of my library. Uh, he's that power toughness. So I'll take all my crap and uh, exile them from the Trench Gower, Gower, uh, Gorger's insatiable appetite. Then I will... One, two, three, four, five. Time warp. Let's do the time warp, Carolyn. So uh, target player takes the next turn after this one. So that will actually only affect me uh, because me and Carolyn don't count. We count as separate players. Trench Gorger being 30-30, I should probably mark. Now, you might play that differently. That's fine. That's just the way that we play around here. Uh, but it's still the first turn. So Carolyn, uh, you can go to combat if you're so inclined. I'll join in. There we go. Okay, so we go to combat. I'm going to attack with Braids. Carolyn's going to attack with Karthus. Guess which one's going to hurt worse? So that's 10 damage. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we mill 10 cards. And doesn't look like any of it's coming back next turn. Nope. Okay, and then uh, are you done, Carolyn? Because I am done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I might have cheated on a mana cost here, but I have enough mana to pay for whatever here with my Soul Ring. Okay, so my next turn, I untap... Upkeep. On my upkeep, I'm going to put in Sunstone. Great piece of tech. And draw. Oh, Magus of the Future. Well, I'm not going to need that. So then, uh, yeah, I'm all in. Let's attack the Horde here for 31 for 34 damage, which is more than adequate when this is at half size to flip it all into the graveyard. The Horde has no zombies in play, just a skeleton. So that means that we win. Great work, Carolyn. High five. Yes!